through the talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Should I go ahead? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry, yep. Okay. okay, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. And I am so privileged to share with you this afternoon about our recent discovery of Mutoto at Pangaya Saidi at a, a cave in um, coastal Kenya. And what are the implications for those sites in regard to the MSA, meaning the Middle Stone Age sites. And i um, very privileged to have uh, worked in that site. And it gives me great pleasure to work because it really changes the direction in which you want to take uh, research, Middle Stone Age research undertaken in Africa. I would like, as before, as I continue, I would like just to point out as a disclaimer that I speak with a heavy West, Western Kenya accent. So in case there's something you might not get very clear, please feel free to maybe request, I can repeat or uh, explain some more. And so without further ado, I'll get into the presentation. So it's Mutoto and my name has been introduced, Imali Ndiyama. I'm the head of Art Sciences Department here at the National Museums of Kenya. So as an, I don't know, um, as an overview of my presentation, I'm going to just give you a quick look overview of Kenya's prehistoric record. And I'm cognizant that I might be preaching to the converted because some of you have already heard, actually have their research in Kenya. So you might be aware I'm very at the end of the Kenya's prehistoric record. And then I'll get into the Stone Age sites in Kenya and why the Middle Stone Age matters in specifically. Then I'll talk about other Kenyan heritage archaeological record along the Kenyan coast and go specifically now to Pangaea Saidi as a prevailed as PYS. And what does it mean in MSA in East Africa, or Kenya in particular and East Africa in broad? And we'll specifically, specifically be addressing the Middle Stone Age on why it is important because of its few number of sites and why this having these sites in a uh, more very unlikely place uh, presents a lot of excitement to us. So the Prince Kenya is endowed with a long standing prehistoric record that actually we call the hotbed of prehistoric research and some of the very iconic or finds that have been found in Kenya includes our iconic Turkana boy, very nearly the most complete Homo erectus skeletal ever found in the world. And uh, we pride ourselves having found that here in Kenya. And some of the heavy earliest evidence of bipedalism, we have uh, evidence of footprints walking across the landscape barefooted and that was actually made in the national news in Kenya. The, evi the earliest evidence of technology as has been presented as the, the dawn of technology. We have it also here in Kenya been found and that made a lot of international news. And the earliest evidence of livestock domestication in Eastern and Southern Africa, which are actually scientists have a concurrence that it is all these sites. And all these actually have been undertaken because of the uh, many research projects that have been undertaken across the, across the country, targeting different sites. So Kenya actually has those long history. And this here, I'm going to that I've only pointed out one archeological time or paleoanthropological perspective. There is still other perspectives such as geological, um, paleontological, paleontological, paleoclimate. So it has a long history that is backed up from different dimensions that actually we can able to see. And in terms of technology, and because of the talk, the heading of today, which is the in terms of the Middle Stone Age, the technological record in Kenya actually is very deep. And starting from the Lomekwan tools recently announced 2015 International News, which is the earliest nap stone tools and dated 3.3, again been found the Kenyan Rift Valley. We have the old one industry, all this has also been found here in Kenya, and the Achulian, which is the early Stone Age. All of these tools actually represented here in Kenya. So we have a very long history and diversity of technological advancement. 
the middle stone age size in Kenya is actually distributed is why we are very excited about Pangaea Saidi. It's because if you look at that map, you see that the middle stone age sites are actually just very few and mostly distributed along the Rift Valley region, but with just one isolated site close to the coast, which context is not fully understood and not much has been published about it. But the major and but very few compared to the long standing archaeological record that I've said about Kenya. And if you look at sites that actually have evidence of the millstone, there are very few. And you look at up north in that map, the Turkana region, which is the epicenter of all paleontological and archaeological research in Kenya, you find that there are only very few sites actually. There's only one site in the east side, Kobifora, one side in the west side, and reported site up in the Ethiopian border in the in south and southwestern Ethiopian region. So you can see there are very isolated, very few sites in the country. And of course, I don't need to dwell much, or I'll mention briefly why the mid stone age matters, but I'm sure we have people, uh, colleagues in this meeting or in the audience that actually uh, study the middle stone age. I think Lucy is one of them and you understand why it's important because it precludes the, it highlights the emergence of anatomically modern human being, the dispersal of human being, dispersal um, of technology and all other kinds. So it's a very important time frame in which we are able, that's what we are, is very keen to understand. But unfortunately, here in Kenya, we have the paucity or the scarcity of these sites, especially as we will see why uh, Pangaea Saidi is important, the sites that have a complete sequence. And one of these sites actually that actually been done is in near Eburu mountain that is uh, called uh, Ntampune Amoto. That's the, among the few sites that have a complete sequence, but just again, it's in the Rift Valley. But having a site, outside the Rift Valley with a continuous occupation record is something that not been found before. And that's why Pangaea Saidi is very exciting to us. So the later Stone Age again, very wide distribution of sites across the country, but again, as you'll see, biased towards the Central Rift region. Not many been found outside that region. So as time goes by, you'll see that the sites are distributed. When it comes to the archaeological sites at, at, uh, within the Kenyan coastal region, we find that actually the majority of the archaeological sites within the Kenyan region are actually the sites associated with the European coming such as Fort Jesus, Swahili civilizations, and the uh, Islamic towns, and all other things that have been found within the coastal region. We have a few. Uh, Iron Age sites found within that region. So for a long time, the main focus, if you hear anyone telling, oh, I'm doing research in coastal Kenya, quickly, you know, oh, they are doing something, Swahili civilizations or the Pochokis monuments, among other important sites, so, um, among other sites that are depicted. So all of that, most, not all, okay, mo un until this time, most of the archeological sites that are found within the coastal Kenya region are actually um, sites with monumental architecture, such as Fort Jesus, which represents the Portuguese occupation built by the Portuguese people during, uh, during the 16th century. And then the Jumbala Mutuana, among all these monumental architecture that are just a representation of the different civilizations that the characterized the interaction between the, the outside world and the Kenyan East Coast, including the Kenyan coast, including the interior. So all those are characterized by the different kind of monumental architecture that we see. But now, uh, when we come specifically, I can just go back forward a little bit and come back because I just wanted to, yeah. To Pangaea Saidi. We have a site known as Pangaea Saidi that we are we've been studying for some time in, in, in that uh, we report here, and that's where the site was found. It's located about 15 kilometers from the coast and within a ridge, a, a limestone ridge called the Zoni Ridge, 
and very dense forests that I will go back now into. And uh, the importance on which we looked at it, actually we studied with it, was within the, we were working with colleagues, working in the ceiling project. And we look at it, the relationship between humans and the environment. We have different environments from the forested environments, clashes, wetlands, rivers, all these actually provide different challenges to humans. But what we don't have, especially for the implications for the Middle Stone Age, we understand, it is to able to understand the origins of human resilience. How are humans supposed to tackle all these environments, changing climatic regimes, and be able to emerge out with these complex cultural and technological innovations that we see today? So, how did, and the questions are killed, how did climate change influence human evolution in Africa? Under what conditions did the behavior of flexibility rise? And that is very common during the middle the middle stone age. And we were in Af were African person population continuous or was it different? And we believe that Fanga Saidi is capable to able to ask, explore these questions. And to answer these questions, we needed the well-dated long-term occupation sites in different environments. And of course, now we have different environments that have actually been done to understand the different records of human occupation. But Kenya's millstone is actually a very key in when we understand it and Pangaea Saidi, therefore comes into mind because of its location along the coastal region, just outside the town of Kilifi. It's a limestone cave, very elaborate as you'll see shortly. And since the site is actually has a religious or a sacred meaning to the local population, we find that actually they are able to only visit the site at a certain time. And you go through land, uh, open land, and then as you go in, you get into dense forests because it is sacred, they have the, this community that they live in there, they are able to conserve the site and you go deep, deeper inside, that's me actually trying to ram in and then it opens into this huge opening of the site that actually have very complex sites, very um, elaborate cave complex. And among them is this Pangaea Saidi that you are able actually we are able to undertake a, it's a massive limestone complex and the walls are actually more than 10 meters high. And uh, by the, some of the roofs, especially where we have done, some of the sections have partially collapsed. And in that context, we are able, able to understand that there's some light coming into the cave. And even the site where we excavate specifically there, this, as you will see, there's light coming in and that's where we are able to excavate. So it's a very narrow, very narrow tropic forest along the area, so within this massive volcanic area. At Pangaea Saidi, we have undertaken four seasons of excavation, at least three meters deep of deposit. And actually, we must tell you today, we had a meeting as a research team, and we believe that actually there's still more. We can still be able to dig some more deposits. So what we do it to understand, to do is under, get a strategy in which we can be able to go deep down and pick, uh, be able to, see how much we, we can dig in a safe way that is safe for the excavators and the rest of the team members. So that is what we were able to undertake recent excavation while in progress and we had to stabilize the walls. And again, yeah, as you can see a different excavations, people are doing it and it took our time up to, up to two meters actually that the, the excavations were able to be undertaken in there. And out of this, we had uh, 28 uh, accelerated mass spectrometry and eight OSL days, which, has, which have actually provided for us a very consistent depth. Um, and, and, and this actually includes the, includes the very important, important transitions in, the, in terms of the environment that are created. So we have and a, co a continuous occupation of 78,000 years. And as I said, this is only where we have reached in terms of the excavation and the deposits are still there. We don't know. There are people who have speculated 
that they might be up to because the wall itself from, from the rooftop of the, the, the cave to where the deposit is is about 10 meters. So there are geologists who look at it and say that it's likely even the deposit might be another 10 meters. So we don't know. So there's still more to be undertaken at this site. So what did we find? So we have also an unlinearity technology that characterized this time frame among the different sites and techno whereby there is a technological advancement and show consistency and, and change. Then there's a prog progress of miniaturization, which begins at a, just go back. Yeah, so, and then no certain appearance of complexity and technology. So innovation developed and restructured at all circumstances. So the, all those things that are happening at a different time frames within the region. And engagement with the coast, we have a lot of uh, coastal shells that in fact we are actually dating, we are picking some that we want to date and about 67,000 years. So as I said, the coastal region, the coast itself is a uh, 70, is 15 kilometers from the coast. So it's likely actually some of these sites are going uh, go extend, uh, it's very easy to walk or access the coast region from, from this cave. So this engagement, the coastal region are seen from the marine shells that uh, has been found in this area. And matching and uh, also if you look at it from the an, uh, environmental point of view, we have actually have the matching environment that matches with the archaeological record. We have passive lake level, local, and where it's doing and dry, and then microlithic evidence, coach, and all these different kind of environments that are associated with this time period across time. So this all this environmental and data that is also matching with archaeological record. And uh, Another aspect we found is aspect of on ornamentation at 67,000 years, and we have different kind of uh, non-utilitarian goods. Some of, uh, for example, ostrich eggshell beads, bone beads, uh, marine she shells, all different, all of them done at different kind of, or at, a, at a different time frames. So in essence, actually, we see that this is a low amplitude of environmental change that's happening within this region. And actually, this therefore provides a, a very complete record of occupation. So we say, where do we go to find? Remember at the beginning, we said, oh, we need a better, a good record to find about, um, to find out about where the occupation, uh, to find out where we have a continuous occupation and see a change of behavior during the Middle Stone Age. Pangaea Said is providing us with that. And some of the excavation data that we have actually, you see, is very different. That, uh, yeah, let us special finds we had were different kind of bones modified at different time frame. And now, and then now, the most important find that we found that made international news was the discovery of Mutoto. Mutoto means a child in Swahili. The soil word for a child, which is a remarkable find, which is intentional burial of a two to three year old individual, and we have called that in total, which is a child for soil. No DNA preservation was found, but the condition shows that the modern human with some more archaic traits, including pig and animal, which is comparatively less modern, less more modern than earlier human beings. So archaic features of Mutoto support the periodic isolation of other populations, while forager ancestry of 4,400 4, BP burial is consistent with long standing community of live waste and population in Eastern Africa. So it was very important for when we found this in total, the aspect, the preservation and the conservation measures that were taken for us to unearth and study this, this find. Mutoto was actually very complex. And that is a story for another day because we took a lot of uh, it took a lot of time. Initially, we thought it was just uh, disintegrating bones. We brought it here at the National Museums of Kenya, and uh, we tried to stabilize it at the, our preparation lab. And then from there, we were able to take it to Spain, where they had this specialized technology that they were able to prepare it properly. And up to now, that we have it. And it's good. I must point out that the material, the space, the Mutoto was found was a, after the study was eventually re returned and is now resident here at the National Museums of Kenya. 
So in terms in regard to understand this the middle, middle stone age behavior as terms, especially at the coastal region in this case, it was important that we had a 3D laser mapping of the caves in order to be able to see, understand it. As I said, you see the blue uh, image is actually, is actually all the different cave complex. So it's very big, it's actually more than, uh, more than 500 meters big, just very complex um, network of caves actually inside. I remember when I went, the first time I went there, I nearly got lost inside just the network itself because some sections are very dark, some sections where the roof has collapsed are easily accessible. You can be able to access them. But then we undertook 3D models and be able to, you can be able to see how the cave actually system it is itself looks in real life. So, and you can see that is the cave network. So how big it is, you can see it, yeah. And some of the studies that are now currently underway include the studying speleothermal of climate records. So we can be understand and one of our colleagues, Hubert, is undertaking that. And the leaf waxes and phytoliths. So we can also be able to understand that and so that we can see the different environmental changes that are happening through time. Lithic use wear and residue analysis that are happening also been able to understand, understand that and because of the a lot of um, lithic material and also macro, micro and macro botanical remains that actually been undone. And uh, Ali, Crowder, Ali Crowder and the other, other colleagues are also attending the University of Queenstown. So you can see this cave is actually very complex and gives a lot of uh, things that we want to understand about resilience to climate change and the Pangasaidi, where but small foragers experience extreme climate fluctuations on local and regional scales. Strategic flexibility and technologies for innovation were critical responses to increasing food resource stress and strategic for resilience to major rapid and climatic shifts may have created vulnerabilities to prolonged arid drift. So all these are now the questions that we are able to understand. And now we look forward to understand, undertaking the studies that have undertaken. That is what we know. So what we know at the moment, that's, this is what we know about Pangaea Saidi. And we look to forward to doing some more and understanding the different aspects that are pointed out and especially so that we can understand the middle stone age behavior. So the implication for this, for the PYS, for the middle stone age in Africa, in Eastern Africa from what provides a very good opportunity when we can look at it from different dimensions. So I just stand, as I said, our, these are collaborations it was done from National Museums of Kenya and the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. That at, in Germany. And so we continue this collaboration and we hope we will be able to understand and answer the different questions that uh, actually emerge and continue with the excavation. And finally, because of the pandemic, the excavation was stopped in 2020. We were actually in the middle of the field season when country started, the border started closing, and uh, our, the, our colleagues who are here had to leave immediately. And uh, since then, we have not been able to undertake further research. but. We have um, <coughs> developed capacity to undertake a, a research continuity with what is available using the locally available technology and resources. So we have worked very collaboratively with interns and other <coughs> volunteers here at the National Museums of Kenya in which we are, kind of, we are able to advance this research in data collection, especially based in the lab and uh, con provided continuity for research even during this difficult time. So I thank you all for your time and happy to answer any questions you might have. <coughs> thank you very much. That was a really excellent talk. It's such a fascinating site. Yeah, does uh, anybody have any questions at all? There's a question in the chat from Lucy. She asks, do you have indication of what the child in Toto died from? Also, were they buried with any special items like shell beads, etc.? Good question. No, unfortunately, we don't have any, uh, in, we don't have a lot of information in what, what the child died from. And there were no, there were no, 
uh, grave goods or any part of material that were found with Mtoto. Either they might have been destroyed or something, but uh, we don't know. We, never, we, we didn't find anything during the excavation, but despite the fact that it was, done, it was uh, carefully done. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like someone has raised their hand. Adam, would you like to ask your question? Adam, would you like to go ahead? Okay, uh, might have some technical difficulties there. I'm sorry about that. Uh, John also has his hand raised. Would you like to ask a question, John? Yes. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. I can hear you. Hi. Uh, hi, Emmanuel. Good to uh, very good to see you again, and and to see you all this. Um, I'm just wondering. Do you think there will be a field season again this year? Uh, you think it's possible to go forward again now? Yes, uh, thank you, John. Good to hear from you. It was nice to see you last week or two weeks ago in Nairobi. Yes, we are okay. We had a meeting this morning, and we are purposing to do it uh, from between September and October and, and November. Oh, that's great. Yes. Uh, does uh, Adam, would you like to have a go at um, asking your question again? If you still want to, uh, see your hand still raised. No, I think we're having technical difficulties there, sorry. Um, any other questions from anyone? Uh, I'll, I'll put another one then, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> Just do it, Emmanuel. So it, it looks to be a really wonderful, brilliant record for uh, 80,000 years. Um, do, you, do you think on the coast you can get earlier Middle Stone Age as well? We don't. In fact, the objective at the moment is to continue survey to see if we can find any other sites. There is a few sites as you see, you saw in the map about Mutongwe, it's slightly south of South Coast region that they have reported a potential site. So, and, and these have not been uh, investigated con conclusively. So we don't know, but uh, certainly, yes, there is a possibility. And also even at Pangaya Saidi itself, uh, I, as I mentioned, we are we are all currently only at three meters, so we don't know what might there might mm. be some more. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. I I I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Walter. No, I wonder if you would uh, elaborate on the uh, cultural artifact you found in the cave, particularly the shells and the bones. Uh, what can they tell us about the people who might have lived there? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And uh, the site, actually, part of the, the you see, there is a lot of very detailed and elaborate non-utilitarian goods, such as uh, the decorated bones, decorated uh, uh, ochre. We have uh, a lot of uh, cow shells, perforated uh, shells, uh, marine shells, among others. So very elaborate, very detailed. But I think it's one, this, one of the things of course we said about is the emergence of a con uh, complex cognitive behavior about this the Middle Stone Age populations. And also wide ranging patterns in which they were able to go as to the coastal region and other things. So, and uh, going uh, beyond that is to one of the uh, things that we want to investigate now is to look at the mobility and ranging patterns. Thankfully, we've been able to find a few obsidian artifacts. So one of the things is try to use that to do the 
geochemical sourcing to understand chemical characterization so we can see if we can be able to see any, any sourcing study well how far they are coming inland because in we have uh, always uh, argued about like i say sometime back i argued about the uh, trying to understand the connection between the inland and the coastal interior in kenya and um, if we can be able to understand to see is to or to create a link between uh, the coastal region and the size in the interior we can that will really be very interesting in, in terms of understanding this long distance ranging patterns um, uh, during the middle stone age and can you tell from these artifacts uh, whether whether there was any trading between uh, the coastal people and then the inland people and also did you find any fishing uh, tools implementations at the in, at, at the top of the excavation, that's uh, something from uh, 20,000. That's when we have uh, elements that are represent coastal paraphernalia, but uh, not coastal, sorry, fishing paraphernalia, but uh, we don't have. Uh, so far, we can't put a finger directly about something that li li uh, links it with the inland, but as I'm saying, uh, obsidian sourcing would be key. We can be able to you see if we can match to any non obsidian sources in the interior in, in the inland and uh, also we can be able to see the different uh, kinds of the they said a lot of diversity in terms of the raw materials also and it varies through time so those are some of the things that we, we like to investigate some more thank you mm -hmm. Thank you very much. There's another question in the chat from AJ saying, thank you for a wonderful talk. Any Hello. illuminations this work has on hominin migrations to the Southern Asian region? Yeah, I have a question. Can I didn't um, oh, Yeah, two to seconds, Adam. Chat. Could you please read the question for me? Thank you. Yeah, so any illuminations this work has on hominin migrations to the southern Asian region? Yes, we are, because we, the fact that we're now at least getting into the occupation within the coastal region, we don't know one of, as I, as I mentioned from the beginning, this project was done under the auspices of a ceilings project, originally was done under the ceilings project. So maybe another aspect to try to investigate now is to see the uh, investigate because they were excavating the coastal region from Mozambique to East Africa. So one of the things is try to understand if we can be able to find similar sites going down south and seeing how they were represented. But as far as uh, across the oceans and seeing others, we don't know. But uh, in the in the past, I've always argued that like, uh, this uh, conference we had and about the. Uh, investigating the migration and coastal and links among the East African coast and the Far East, but uh, of course not in the time frame in which we are talking about at the moment, but it's possible. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adam, uh, would you like to try again uh, to ask your question? Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, go hear. ahead. Yes, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, for this uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, Is there any evidence uh, to support that the issue of out of Africa? I mean, here exactly the migration uh, from the East Africa to Oracle. Do I have do we have any evidence to show about the what migration to east to Euro Asia or I didn't yes yes migration from the East Africa to Eurasia to Euro Asia no I we don't have but those are some of the things that we like to investigate maybe even go uh, uh, of course subject to the safety if it was safe to do research in Somalia Somalia and going up north. Maybe that's um, some of the things that we could be able to investigate and see on see if there's even more sites going up north. But uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have anything that we can tie it um, 
between Panga Saidi and the Kenyan coast and going up north. But uh, certainly presents for us a very exciting opportunity that we can be able to look at it and uh, look at some more and, and pursue it more. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, Larry, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that overview. Uh, it was really useful. Thank you. Um, I just like a little bit more information, if you can, on the on the habitat uh, around Pangaea Saidi and how it fluctuated over time, because we have this wonderful cave sequence you've presented of, with continuity in occupation. Were there any periods mm. where that um, that habitat was actually quite stressed by wider regional, maybe even global changes in climate? Yes. I, mm, I'm going to try and see if I can post the, do the PowerPoint again. Because I had a slide actually that shows that we have a very good uh, and long environmental change that will be able to be captured through time. And I said one of our colleagues is now doing a study uh, in the micro and macro botanical remains because so we can be able to understand the different environmental changes that happen through time. And they are all captured through the sequence. As I said, there are uh, 19 occupational, occupational episodes that we are seeing in the archaeological record. Thank you very much. If you, um, contact me, sorry. if you contact me also, if you contact me later, uh, I can tell, be able to share with you detailed information about the environment. Uh, Walter, I see you've raised your hand again. Did you have another uh, another question? Uh, no, I'm having trouble getting my hand down. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, uh, I think we'll end it there then. So thank you all, all very much for coming. And thank you very much to Emmanuel for coming and giving this talk. It was really fascinating. Uh, a recording of this talk should be available tomorrow on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and rewatch it. Um, we don't have another talk for the next few weeks, unfortunately. Um, but keep an eye out as uh, on our Twitter and for our emails as that may change. So uh, yeah, thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you very much to Dr. Ndiema for that fascinating talk. So hopefully we'll see you all again. Yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, it's been nice touching this and we look forward actually to more collaborations and seeing more Liverpool people here. Lucy, we hope to see you this side now that the borders are opening. Yes, hopefully soon. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.